Lady Sayadaw was the first Vipassana teacher we know of in this tradition in modern times. Of course, there was a long chain of teachers going from him right back to the original Arahants who were sent to Burma by Ashoka, and even before that, back to the Buddha. But we know very little about them. Almost all of the names, what they did, who they were, are lost in the mists of time. But when we come to this modern age, this man, this famous monk, Lady Sayadaw, was the first we know about in detail of his life, and it was a remarkable life. This is him, a revered monk, and he was born during a great flowering of the Pariyati, the study of the texts in Burma at that time. Numerous monks were studying the texts, real scholars, and he himself became a famous scholar. But his great innovation was different. The actual practice of Vipassana seems just to have been confined to a few people in Burma, here and there, mostly monks just in the forest. Householders didn't get a look in. And his great innovation was to start spreading the actual practice widely and to householders. And it's because of him doing that, his foresight in doing that, that we could get the technique today. And we're very grateful to him just for that reason. This is the chain of teachers since Lady Sayadaw. He taught Sayatet. Sayatet taught Saiji Ubakin. Ubakin taught Goenkaji. Goenkaji taught us. He was born in Upper Burma, a small rural village. He had three younger brothers. Two became monks, one a devoted householder. And when he was born, it said that a brilliant rainbow appeared on his estate, went into the roof of his house, and then ascended from the roof of his house into the sky. The villagers were astonished, and his parents named him Tat Kong, which means one who ascends to the summits. And he did indeed do that in both Pariyati, the theory of Dhamma, and the practice, and we shall see how. He had a traditional education. Age of 10, he was sent to the local monastery under a monk there, Unanda, for his education, Pali grammar, Burmese grammar, and learning the suttas. And at the age of 15, he becomes a Samanera, a novice, as was very traditional. And then there's a blip. At the age of 18, he suddenly decides he's going to leave the robes. He disrobes, goes back to the normal householder's life. Why? Because he felt his education was too narrow. It was all Pali, it was all the Buddha's teachings, nothing else. And he thought there must be something else, something wider. It was too restricted. And this shows a very early sign of Lady Sayadaw as a highly independent, innovative thinker, which he was all his life. Now, Unanda, his preceptor, was very disappointed because he was such a bright student. And so he and another monk went off to the young Tat Kong and tried to persuade him to come back. He didn't want to come back. And they said, well, surely you still want to continue your education? And he said, yes. He was a bright young man. He wanted to do that. And he was offered, well, you could learn the Vedas, the Hindu Vedas. And he really liked that idea. And then they said, oh, well, the monk who teaches the Hindu Vedas is a monk, and in order to learn them, you'll have to take robes again. So they caught him. He took robes again, and he never disrobed for the rest of his life. He mastered the Hindu Vedas in eight months. And Later on, he confessed to one of his students that actually his intention 
had been to make a career in fortune-telling by knowing the Vedas. And he said his teachers, out of their wisdom and compassion, saved him. So then he continued his education. Age 20, he ordained as a full monk, again under Unanda, and the name is Jnana Dajja, the Banner of Wisdom. All the quotes you see on these slides are from Lady Sayadaw himself. He's not yet called Lady Sayadaw. At this stage, he's called U Jnana Dajja. And he's an ambitious young man, so he decides to leave his local village and seek his fortunes in Mandalay. Now, let's have a look at the map of Burma. Let's orient ourselves first. Now, you'll see Mandalay up top, and he was born a little bit further north, near Shwebo, but another very important town in the whole of his life is Moniwa. That town became closely associated with him. Moniwa is surrounded by thick forests, and also you'll see this river flowing down, the Chindwin River. All along that river are caves where he used to meditate later. So Moniwa became his base, a very important place in his life. Now, one other thing to notice about this map is the pink area below. That area had been conquered by the British. It was part of the British Empire. There had been two Anglo-Burmese wars, both won by the British. Each time they took bigger and bigger chunks of Burma. And now the bit that was left was the white bit up top with Mandalay as its center, its royal capital, and the long shadow of British empire was hanging over Burma and the threat of further occupation was obvious. And this would have a very profound effect on his thinking, and we shall see how. Now, Burma at that time was ruled by King Mindon, a very good king, a strong king, but living under this threat of British invasion or occupation. And Mindon's response, he was a very devoted king, was to devote himself to Dhamma as much as possible, to gain as much merit as possible. He built monasteries, he built pagodas, he built stupas. He even put a finial, that's a top piece, on top of the Shwedagon in British-held Burma. This is the biggest pagoda he tried to build. As you can see, it's massive. It was never completed. Perhaps that's just as well, because the tradition, the prophecy was that when that pagoda was completed, Burma would fall. That's the bell that goes with the pagoda. Just imagine being woken up by that at 4 a.m. And King Mindon was supporting the Sangha big time. In the whole of Burma, it seems there were something like 690,000 monks. And in Mandalay alone, Mindon built 400 monasteries, each for 2,000 monks. So Mindon himself was supporting 80,000 monks just in Mandalay. 3,000 teaching monks, 60,000 learning monks. So Mandalay was the place to be. And of all the places in Mandalay, the top monastery was this one, Sankyong Taik. Now, when King Mindon moved, he moved his royal capital from Ava up to Mandalay. He dismantled his old palace, a wooden palace, and rebuilt it in Mandalay as a monastery, donating it to the Sangha, and this was Sankyong Taik. And the head of Sankyong Taik was a real heavyweight abbot. He had been personal tutor to the king. He was on the king's council. He was famous for having translated an old Sri Lankan text, the Vishuddhi Magga, which weighs in at 800 pages. He translated that. And there he was, de facto head of all the monks in Burma. And here he was, abbot of this monastery. So this was the place to be. And Unyana Dajja rocks up, tries to gain entry, and 
the entry examination, because it's a hard place to gain entry, is you have to recite the 227 precepts for a monk off by heart. As you know, a householder like us takes five precepts. On a course, we take eight. A monk lives by 227. And Unyana Daja recited them straight off and gained entry. And there was no room to sleep, no beds, so he had to sleep on a mat by the water pot. And every time anybody wanted water, he had to move. So he needed to get away from that mat. Every evening, the monks would come together and recite the 227 precepts, part of their daily routine. And Unyana Daja had a very loud, clear voice, and soon he was leading that recitation, and of course he became noticed, noticed by the abbot. So the abbot calls him in. And so he, this young monk, 21 years old, has an interview with this abbot. And there's another monk there, a very senior monk, also on the king's council. And the interview apparently was quite short. The abbot said, what's your name? And he said, U Nyanadajasa. And the abbot said, that's a good name. You'd better study with me. So here he is, this young monk, 21 years old, personal protege of the head of all the monks in Burma, and also studying with this other senior monk as well. And he's got personal access to the Sankyon Sayadaw Abbot's personal library. And in those days, that was not a small thing because books were hand copied. So that was a huge element of trust. So there he is studying. And this is a monastery which studied the entire Tipitaka. That was the curriculum. And here it is. And you will see that there's the canonical Pali and the headings above. These are the actual words of the Buddha. And then across you get the Atakata and the Tika. They're just the commentaries. But even if you just look at the canonical Pali, you've got the Vinaya. That's the rules for the monks, 2,000 pages. The Sutta. That's the discourses, the ones we all know, seven or 800 pages, and the Abhidhamma, higher Dhamma, very complex, detailed analysis of mind and matter. When Goenkaji chants the day five morning chanting, the Tikapatana, that is part of the Abhidhamma, a very small part of it. Total of 8,000 pages. He mastered it. Whether he did the commentary as well, I don't know. And he became a lecturer, and daily, with that beautiful, loud, clear voice of his, he was lecturing to 2,000 monks every day. Now, King Mindon took his responsibilities as a king very seriously, and the particular responsibility was to protect the Sangha and protect the Dhamma. And he decided to call the Fifth Great Sangha Council to establish the texts to check them. You probably remember Goenkaji's story about the first great council after the death of the Buddha, the one which Ananda famously just managed to attend when he became an arahant. Ashoka held the third one. The second was also held in India. The fourth was held in Sri Lanka. And here's the fifth held by King Mindon in Burma, attended by 600 monks, and it seems many thousands of householders. It was held in the royal palace, and the way they did it was they took the whole of the canonical Pali and divided it up between those 600 monks, or some of them, each one reciting them, reciting his part, and the other monks, those 600, many of them textual experts themselves, would be listening for mistakes. U Nyana Daja was asked to recite the fifth book of the Abhidhamma, several hundred pages. And this book was called the Book of Contentions. It was a listing of all the wrong views which can be advanced, the heretical views, if you like, and how to refute them. And it was written by Moggaliputta Tissa, an arahant, who was Ashoka's personal teacher. 
So suddenly we get a direct connection between Ashoka right down to Lady Sayadaw. So you can imagine a formidable experience, standing up, reciting several hundred pages in front of 600 textual experts looking for mistakes. He did it straight through, no memory aids, no notes, nothing. Everyone was amazed. So his reputation became higher and higher. King Mindon, to preserve the texts, also decided to have them inscribed in marble, marble slabs, and the picture that you see here is Kutador Monastery in Burma, and all these little pagodas there, little white pagodas, each of them has four marble slabs with the Tipitaka inscribed on it. That's the whole Tipitaka. So there was King Mindon preserving that. Now, sometime later, the abbot decides that he's going to set an examination for the monks on the paramis. 20 questions. 2,000 monks set the exam. Out of all of them, only Unyanadaja could complete the exam 100% correct. Later on, his answers were published in a book, the Parami Dipani. Dipani means a manual, so the manual of the Paramis. And this was the first of many, many manuals which he published. So now he was a published author. He was later awarded the title by the abbot of Patamasacha, first lecturer. All these quotes here on the paramis are from Unyanadaja. So now this young man has arrived. He's at the top of his game. He's the top lecturer, living in the top monastery, a published author. He seems to have everything. And at this point, disaster strikes. About a year later, King Mindon died, and he was succeeded by Tibor, one of his sons. Tibor was a very weak king. It is said he never even left his palace compound, and gradually he lost control of the whole countryside. We hear of provincial governors being murdered, ministers in league with dacoit gangs, fires in the city. Ultimately, he controlled very little beyond the in environs of Mandalay itself. And then in 1883, a great fire swept through Mandalay, the northern quarter of it. It destroyed most of the royal palace, which was wooden, and most of Sankyong Taik. So now, this young Unyanadaja had lost his home and lost almost all of his books and notes. It looked like a total disaster. He left Mandalay. He went back to the village of his birth. And then he repaired to Moniwa, which is his base thereafter, his local town. But although it looked like a disaster, he now had more time. And this was actually the time when, after teaching during the day, because he was still teaching, he would go out and meditate at night. And every year, he'd take a rainy retreat in the forests around Moniwa for the next three years. Back to Tibor, things get worse. After the Second Anglo-Burmese War, the British had gained the right to sail up and down the Irrawaddy and bear royal regalia on their ships, which was a humiliation to the Burmese kings, which they did. But more than that, they just started logging illegally in the Burmese forests. Very unwisely, Tibor decided to impose a fine on them. The British response was swift and decisive. They sent him, an, they didn't pay the fine, they sent him an ultimatum demanding complete control of all Burmese foreign policy. Tibor hesitated, didn't want to do it. The British didn't wait, they invaded. The picture on the left below shows British troops in 1885 disembarking at Yangon, ready for the campaign. The campaign lasted 12 days. The Burmese army was totally overwhelmed. The British overran the country 
got to Mandalay, ransacked Mandalay, arrested Tibor, ransacked the palace looking for treasure, and they'd conquered the whole of Burma. Tibor was then taken in an ox cart, again a further humiliation, down to Yangon, put on a ship, a British ship, and taken into exile in India, near Bombay, and never again saw his native Burma. The picture on the right shows Tibor being shown onto the British ship at Yangon, the last time he set foot on Burma. All of this had a major effect on Lady Sayadaw. Now, something that started happening very quickly with the arrival of the British was meat-eating. The British loved their beef, still do. A British regiment is called the Beef Eaters, and alcohol and opium. Unyana Dajja was not impressed and decided to run a campaign, particularly against meat-eating. He wrote an open letter on cows, arguing that to kill cows was like killing your father and your mother. The oxen tilled your fields, the cows gave you milk. Killing them was like killing your father and your mother. And the letter, this open letter, was quite poetic, and he actually takes the point of view of a cow, you can see in this quote, saying, how would you feel if you were a cow and this was happening to you? So a strong appeal, and he started going around the area, giving talks on not eating meat. And he was a very powerful speaker. A few years ago, an old Burmese lady recalls being taken as a five-year-old girl by her parents to one of Lady Sayadaw's talks on not eating beef. She remembers the talk, and she remembers that her parents never again touched meat in their lives. So that was the power of the speeches. He also campaigned against opium and alcohol. He expected not to be very popular with the British. He wasn't. But in a way, the British respected him. His attitude was never political. It was always about personal behavior. So they never touched him. After some time, he leaves Moniwa. To the north of Moniwa, there is a forest called Lady Forest. It's a thick jungle inhabited by wild beasts. It was reputed to be haunted, and no local would go there, would even enter it. So Unyana Dajja takes a few of his students, goes into the forest, chooses a large tree, and then says to his students, you can leave me here. I'm going to stay here and retreat. So the students are sent back, and so here he is in this horrible place with wild animals, supposedly ghosts. He starts, the atmosphere must have been horrible. He starts sending strong metta. And after a while, the whole atmosphere of the jungle changes. It becomes a calm, peaceful, welcoming place. And then his students start coming back, not only his own students, others, monks, householders, all coming to learn from him, to meditate with him, to practice with him. And that was the beginning of Lady Monastery. Huts, halls, stupas were built, and he taught there for 13 years. At the same time, always doing his duties, cleaning the toilets, sweeping the compound, nursing six monks. Now the photograph there, of course, is not Lady Monastery. The buildings are much newer than that. It's actually Dhamma Nyana Dajja, which is a Vipassana center, very near there. And I think on the left, you can see they're still building the pagoda. You can go and you can take 10-day courses there and get those nice vibrations. After 13 years, he decides he's going to go on a pilgrimage. And so he travels by train and ship. He, went, he goes to Bodh Gaya and the sacred places in India. And 
One thing, of course, he would have seen was the power of the British Empire, but much more important, he was shocked by the state of the sacred places in India. Overrun, overgrown, neglected, in disrepair, that was Bodh Gaya. Compare that with the deep veneration and care with which the Burmese looked after, say, the Shwedagon, or their sacred places. And not only that, but a Hindu priest had taken occupancy in Bodh Gaya and was saying, oh, this is a Hindu sacred site. Buddhists were not welcome. And there was very little, maybe no respect for monks. Buddha's teachings in India were regarded as false, not good. And either then or maybe later, probably then, he came to the realization that if ever Dhamma was to spread in India, it could not be through the monks. It would have to be through householders. And that again had a huge impact on his later actions. But at a deeper level, his pilgrimage gave him great inspiration. On the way back, on the boat, in two days, he wrote another manual, the Paticca Samupada Dipani, which is the chain of causation. Wrote it in two days with pencil and paper, with no reference books. He didn't need any. But even more than that, when he gets back, his practice is inspired. And so he stops off before he gets back to Lady Monastery near Yangon at a place called Twenty and does a retreat at Twenty. And after his retreat, he writes this poem. And when you read it, it's an astonishing claim. With lion-like intellectual powers, I've completed the path of the jhana. That means he's got all the jhanas. He's controlled all the masteries above and below the realms of Brahma. He set his flag of power, and at the time of the next Buddha, he will be unsurpassed. Now, I don't quite know what that means, but maybe it means he knows he'll be the chief disciple of the next Buddha, or at least some very, very prominent unsurpassed in a particular area, maybe chief disciple. Now, please remember that for a monk to claim false attainments is one of the four great offenses for which you can be expelled from the order. And not only that, but we hear of monks who'd committed this offense of actually being stoned in the villages. So probably very wisely, he didn't publish this. He kept it quiet, he kept the poem, and late in his life, he gave it to one or two of his students, Uwunita, and it seems maybe Sayatet as well. But he didn't publish it at this stage. So now he goes back, goes back to Lady Monastery, spends another five years there. This is now a thriving monastery, 500 monks. And after five years, he just leaves it. He says to his second in command, all right, it's yours now, you look after it. And he goes off to practice meditation more seriously. And he takes a series of retreats. You remember I mentioned along the Chindwin River, very near Moniwa, there are many caves along there. He would meditate in those caves and in the forests around Sagang. And this is one of those caves, apparently a favorite one. Of course, that's not Lady Sayadaw in the picture, that's a model, but it does give you an idea of the cave. And you can go there today and you can meditate there. And I'm told you get a very good meditation. And there are many stories about his retreats. One time he was with a friend, Uindaka, Uindaka fell sick, so every day Lady Sayadaw would go into the local village, collect the food, bring it back to Uindaka till he got well again. Another time, he was near Kaiktiyo, walking in the forest with a group of monks. And suddenly, they were charged by a herd of elephants. Being charged by one elephant would be terrifying. You can just imagine what a herd of elephants would be like. These are wild elephants. All the other monks ran for their lives. 
scampered up the trees. Lady Sayadaw didn't move. He stood there, right in the middle of the path, and just started sending strong metta. The charge slowed down. The elephant slowed down to a walking pace. As they got near to him, it said they bowed their heads and quietly turned away. After that, you can imagine his reputation got ever greater. Now, you probably remember that Lady Sayadaw was an Abhidhamma expert. The Abhidhamma, the higher Dhamma, that 8,000 pages of detailed study of mind and matter. And for most people, 8,000 pages is too much. The Abhidhamma was very precious to the Burmese. There's an old story, it's probably not true, but it does indicate the state of the Burmese mind. Long time ago, there was a shipwreck, and the Tipitaka was lost to sea and the three parts went to different places. The Vinaya, the rules for the monks, went to Thailand. The suttas, the discourses, went to Sri Lanka. And the Abhidhamma went to Burma. And the Burmese held it as very precious. And the tradition was that when Buddha's teachings declined, the Abhidhamma would be the first thing to be lost. So they held it in very high regard and set great importance on its study. But studying 8,000 pages, is rather a lot. So most people studied it with the aid of a summary called the Sangaha, or the Compendium. Now this Sangaha, an old 10th or 11th century Sri Lankan text, very concise, just 50 pages, very precise, very accurate, but hard to read just on your own. So normally, it was studied with a commentary. And the standard commentary was the Vibhavani, also a Sri Lankan text. And they were studied together, and the two were usually published together as well, as one volume. Now, when he was in Mandalay, Lady Sidor had noticed that his own teachers never used the Vibhavani. And he'd also overheard Sri Lankan monks in Burma saying, oh, the Burmese don't really understand the Abhidhamma because there are so many errors in the Vibhavani. So Lady Sayadaw decides he's going to correct them. And he publishes his own work, the Paramatta Dipani Tika. Dipani, remember, is a manual. Tika is a, uh, a commentary. Paramatta is ultimate truth. And he picks up 245 errors in the Vibhavani. And this ignites a huge controversy. Remember that the Abhidhamma was a very sacred text. The Burmese were very sensitive about it. And Lady Sayadaw's tone throughout his work is blunt, it's terse. He starts off with the quote below. In this world, there are many commentaries People haven't gained satisfaction from them, so they came to me for an explanation of the ultimate truth. And then he lists the errors, numbered 1 to 245, straight down the page. And the statements are things like, this cannot be accepted, this is incorrect, this is wrong, this cannot be held. It's pretty strong stuff. As a result of this, when it was published, there was an outroar. Forty books were written refuting him, angry books, combative books, and they were published. Twenty other monks published their own commentaries, all trying to refute Lady Sayadaw. Public meetings were held to refute him. And one time when he came to Yangon, another monk even suggested publicly burning his books before he came. It didn't happen. <coughs> now, why? Such a huge, such a huge controversy. One reason was the sensitivity about the Abhidhamma, although he was not actually attacking the Abhidhamma itself, he was just talking about the commentary. Another was the advent of the printing press. This was new. In the old days, the Sangha, when it was strong, 
had held a tight control of what was published because everything was written out by hand and they exercised censorship. But now with the printing press, there was no censorship. It was available to any monk or any householder who took an interest. And there were letters to the popular papers, even, meetings, all kinds of things. And Lady Sayadaw, meantime, mostly just stayed in his cave. He received these reports, maintained an attitude of totally cool detachment, and just said, sooner or later, all these other commentaries will disappear, and mine will be the one that's left. And he was right. Today, none of the other commentaries, you can't even get them. His is the only one that's in print, last published by the Vipassana Research Institute, our organization, in 2003. Now, a word about the British presence, because of course, Lady Sayadaw and everybody is now living under British occupation. We've already seen his early response. And the British officially maintained an attitude of neutrality towards religion. They'd got a big shock in India after the Indian mutiny, which was partly religious-based, and Queen Victoria issued this edict to all those in authority in her empire. No interference with any religious belief or worship of any of our subjects. And the rulers of Burma, the governors of Burma, stuck to this. And the official British position was impartiality. But this was actually deeply offensive to the Burmese. The king was gone, and the king was the traditional supporter, and they had expected that similarly the British would support the Sangha and the Dhamma, and they didn't. They just kept hands off. And at one point, even a group of senior monks went to the British governor and said, look, could you please appoint a senior monk, a head monk for all Burma? That's what the kings always used to do, and the governor wouldn't. So that was the official British policy. But at the same time, the British had their civil service, and they started founding schools everywhere with a new curriculum, English-based, and if you wanted to progress in the civil service, you had to pass these exams being offered by these schools, and the monks refused to teach these new subjects. So they were sidelined. Parents who wanted their children to get on started sending their children to these British schools, and often as not, the schools were run by Christian missionaries. And the Christian missionaries were anything but impartial. And you'll see the description below. They've seen their children taught to deride their parents and monks as heathens. The missionaries were constantly undermining the old Dhamma, and they even tried to convert people, even offering money if they would convert. So it was a horrible situation for the Burmese and caused Lady Sayadaw to think very deeply about the response to this. And his response was, well, the king is gone. The king can't protect the Sangha anymore. The Sangha is weak, it's broken. The people will have to protect the Dhamma. So now he starts spreading Dhamma widely to the people. He's invited back to Mandalay. He actually wrote a poem to the Prime Minister, the former Prime Minister, Prime Minister to Mindon and Timbor, Tibor, who invites him to Mandalay to fill a teaching vacuum. So he's lecturing there for a while, but his fame has spread and he starts getting invitations all over the country. And she responds to them. And from about 1903 to 1914, he crisscrosses the country in, as it were, perpetual motion, giving talks here, talks there. And you can see from these British comments the power of his talks. There were few more powerful preachers. Remember, these are British talking, not Burmese. A thorough knowledge of human nature, a delightful sense of humor, and a fine voice. He held immense crowds rapt. And then the British governor himself his passionate eloquence drew immense congregations. Wherever he went, he was greeted by enraptured throngs. You might remember from the 
Webu Saidor video. You remember seeing the women bowing down before Webu Saidor, spreading their hair out so that he could tread on it? Same thing. This was happening to Lady Saidor as well. And with that fine voice of his, uh, he was dealing, he had no microphones, of course, nothing like that in those days. He just relied on his voice. And this was a total contrast to previous Dhamma talks given by Burmese monks. In the old days, the monk would simply sit up there, he'd recite great slabs of the suttas or something like that. The householders would listen patiently, no animation, nothing like that. And very often, they would give the talk what's called fan up. He holds his fan in front of his face, so the householders can't even see the face, no, no contact with his audience at all, and the householders just think, oh, we're earning merit just by listening. Lady Sayadaw's approach was totally different. And wherever he went, because of his popularity, he was donated monasteries. Many monasteries were given to him up and down the country, forest retreats, education centers. And he wasn't only talking, he was writing. He wrote poems, he wrote more manuals, he wrote something like over 100 manuals in his life, many in response to householders. They would write to him and say, can you please explain this, can you please explain that? And he'd write a manual, 20 or 30 pages, a voluminous writer, and of course he was writing with pencil. And because he got through so many pencils, other monks would sharpen them for him. And it was said that when he was in full flow, he'd use 100 or 200 pencils every day. That was the extent. No spell check afterwards, no editing afterwards, he just wrote it. And he was very interested to spread Dhamma beyond Burma. Uh, he was in active correspondence with the Pali Text Society in Britain. He was published by them. And he felt that the Abhidhamma was the answer to foreign religions. The sure logic, he said, would ultimately win the debate. And he wrote one manual called the Vipassana Deepani, Manual on Vipassana, which was specifically for foreigners, translated into English. One particular poem he wrote became incredibly popular. It was called the Paramata Sankhita, Summary of the Ultimates, Ultimate Truth. And this was a summary of the Abhidhamma, even shorter than the old Sangha. The Sangha was 50 pages, this was just 690 verses, and the whole Abhidhamma was condensed into it. And you'd use abbreviations to keep it even shorter. Example here, me, ka, mu, u. Me is metta, ka is karuna, mu is mudita, sympathetic joy, u is upeka, equanimity. And you'd use things like that, which made it very easy for them to memorize. First printed 1904, and it ran to 50,000 copies. Even today, that's a respectable print run. In Burma, that was astonishing. Many study associations were formed. It's said that three or 400,000 people were in these study associations throughout Burma, studying this, particularly this poem he wrote. And if you could memorize it, which everyone was trying to do, you got a little certificate uh, saying, oh, you know, now you've memorized this poem, you've got a picture of Lady Sayadaw, and you got even a little cash prize, just a few cats. So that became very popular. And there was one meeting uh, where it was mentioned, this was in Moulmain, down in the south. The meeting was so big that it took 75 carts to bring all the women students to that particular meeting. That's the popularity. Whenever he'd arrive at a place or leave a place, often his students would line the road reciting this poem out of respect to him as he arrived and again as he departed. But it wasn't just about teaching the theory of Abhidhamma. He was saying, we want to endow people with the tools of liberation in this very life. He's into the practice. And then again, he says, not much point in formal lectures. Now, this is coming from the 
most senior lecture in Mandalay. Perhaps only he could have said that. So he's into teaching meditation. And here are a few quotes from his manuals about the practice of meditation. Now, the old attitude to meditation was that really this was for the monks. The jhanas were needed, very difficult to get the jhanas. You pretty much had to be a monk. Householders never had time for that. And so the householders basically don't even bother. Just give dana, keep shila, hope you'll get a better life next time. Lady Sayadaw took a totally different attitude. He said, you don't need the jhanas. All you need is kanika samadhi, momentary samadhi. As long as you can feel your breath, can feel sensation, you can do vipassana. Householders can do it. Even, he said, hunters and fishermen, people with livelihood, killing others, can still practice and should practice. And he said, this is the time, this is the opportunity. He gave the example of a boatman with little control over his rudder, going carried down a swift torrent of a river, the fate of a normal human being. He passes areas where there are only mountains, only forests, no safe anchorage. These are the eras when there is no Buddha's teaching available. And then he passes safe anchorages, cities and towns, but at night he can't see them. This is the period when Buddha's teachings are available, but he's in the wrong place, he can't get them. And then sometimes he passes towns, villages where there is safe anchorage, he can see them, but he can't control his rudder, he can't get there. These are beings who have no control over their minds and can't practice. And so they're carried into the wide ocean of samsara. And he's saying, don't do that, practice now. And he even talks about how to take a retreat. It's very familiar. Start with the precepts. Go straight to the samadhi, to the breath. When your samadhi is fully established, go to panya. And he completely demystifies panya. It's not complicated. He says, even if you can just be with sensation and be with those four elements, earth, air, fire, and water, and feel them, then you can do vipassana. And of course, he says, householders are busy. A lot of the time, they can't do retreats. All right, he says, an hour or so in the morning and an hour or two in the evening. It all sounds very familiar. Now, one student of his who started practicing very seriously was a man called Upo Tet from Lower Burma, a farmer. He left his farm, and for 14 years, he went out doing long retreats. After about seven of those years, don't know exactly when, he met Lady Sayadaw. Lady Sayadaw encouraged him and said, spend more time on your own in retreats. And so Tet was practicing in caves down the Chindwin River and also at Lady Sayadaw's monastery, long retreats. He goes home after 13 years, practices at home. And then after 14 years, he comes back to Lady Sayadaw with his family, reports his attainments. And Lady Sayadaw immediately appoints him as a teacher, the first householder teacher. And here are the words he used. My great pupil, take my staff. That was a very significant thing to give someone your staff. From today onwards, teach the Dhamma of Rupa and Nama pay homage to the sasana in my stead. So there he is, he said, go and teach. But not just that. Remember that this was the first householder teacher that we know of since the time of the Buddha. So he's not only spreading Dhamma to householders saying you can practice, but he's appointing a householder teacher. And then the next day, this is in his monastery, he calls his monks and he says, take note, this lay person is my great pupil he is capable of teaching meditation like me. So he's saying, taking a course from Sayatet is as good as taking a course from me. And you should practice meditation with him and take a course with him and practice. So suddenly, not only is Sayatet 
a householder teacher, the first ever, but he's teaching the monks. And the first course, given to about 25 monks for about 10 or 15 days, is held right there, learned monks, in Lady Sayadaw's own monastery, right under Lady Sayadaw. And Sayatet went on to teach thousands. In his final years, the honors kept coming. 1911, he was awarded the title of Aga Mahapandita. It means top great scholar, literally, by the British, not by the Burmese. Big ceremony, he doesn't bother to attend. He just sends one of his students to pick up the award. A little bit later, Yangon University is opened, grand opening ceremony. He's awarded an honorary doctorate of literature. Again, doesn't attend, just sends one of his students. He's getting old now. At 73, he became blind. Probably that was because of long years of reading and writing in poor light. His eyesight gradually failed. So after that, he couldn't write anymore, of course. So he just practiced meditation and taught meditation. His last two years were spent at one of the monasteries donated to him many years ago in Pinmana, which is down below Mandalay. Passed away on the full moon day of July 1923, age 77. And this is Goenkaji's tribute to him. And let's remember how grateful we are had he not appointed a householder teacher, Sayatet, who taught thousands, who taught Ubakin, who taught Goenkaji, Goenkaji, we would almost certainly never have got this technique. It was because of his foresight, his innovation, and his decisiveness that we're able to get it today. Thank you.